out of here in time to be able to watch the presidential debates, even though staying here for, from now until 10 would be much more interesting than the presidential debates. Uh, my name is Eric Belsky. I direct the Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, we're a joint center between the Graduate School of Design and the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, we're here tonight to talk about the role that architecture and design have played in affordable housing, uh, more specifically programs that involve some form of government support, whether that comes in the form of a direct subsidy or if you were considered tax incentives, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between them. And the idea of the course is to, uh, the idea of the, of the event is to try to think a little bit about whole way in which architecture and the, the world of low-income housing have intersected with one another in ways that we think are really important to understand and very interesting to think about. Uh, and the, the, the grand sweep of this essentially is that the first real engagement of architecture and design with uh, low-income housing was around public housing. And architecture really took the form there of two things, uh, one of which is very well known in the, in the public's eye, and one which isn't. It really started, if you really go back, it started with kind of a, a new town kind of idea when there was military housing built. But once public housing was started, the first architecture was really uh, barely architecture. It was barracks-like uh, uh, buildings that were low-slung and very minimalist. Uh, but what became, I think, identified in the public mind with architecture and its relationship to uh, low-income housing policy and programs in the United States is the image of what's been called the tower in the park, or large uh, public housing buildings uh, in, uh, in a space that was uh, inward focused and with a large kind of courtyard and very vertical in its nature, uh, pretty stripped down in its appearance, which of course modernist architecture, which is it was thought of as being, doesn't necessarily have to be stripped down, but uh, when you're doing it and projecting it into the context of low-income housing, obviously the government has an interest in containing costs and a lot of uh, political interests were interested in trying to make a sharp distinction between market rate housing and public housing. And so it was built in a, in a not particularly uh, exciting visual style. And because public housing over time uh, had many uh, challenges, not the least of which was serious uh, deterioration, uh, often located in poorly situated areas that were isolated from other parts of the metropolitan space and opportunity, uh, many of them uh, fell into disrepair. And so in the American mind, we would posit uh, part of the, the, the view of what modernist architecture was all about became fused with this uh, essential uh, failure of, uh, of a financing system for public housing, which we'll hear more about tonight. Uh, and you know the reaction was so extreme there really wasn't a role for formal role for architecture in uh, affordable housing for some time uh, until the 1990s when there was an effort to redevelop some of that very housing, barrack style housing, tall. Uh, tall, modernist style in the American uh, vernacular's approach to thinking about things, housing, and it was replaced with something that was uh, new urbanist. And of course, the modernist projects were criticized for looking like they had been transplanted, dropped down, uh, alien looking forms in an urban landscape that had been a lot of row houses and other things that were not even part of the street grid. And what they did is they replaced them with something that looked like a suburban ideal. Uh, which the people in the public housing reacted negatively to because it meant less units, but the people who got to come back responded very positively to it because they had the same image in their mind of what uh, you know uh, an American dream home looked like, but looked, and, and you can see this in many cities, somewhat equally out of place. But what really happened, and that's important that we want to emphasize in this, is that there was another program that was created. It was intended to be allocated by states. It's called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And would help finance housing in a new way, in a much more locally responsive way, uh, without any architecture style being imposed or, or inserted into the process uh, from a central authority, but created a scope for innovation. And in fact, some great innovation occurred. Uh, but the amount of that innovation was limited, and most of the housing was built 
uh, like uh, market rate housing. It looked a lot like market rate housing, even though the people that were being housed often uh, people realized had a whole series of other social issues and needs that actual architecture and design that was oriented towards thinking about the special needs of the people who might be living in those uh, communities could use, uh, and yet it hasn't played that role. So we want to kind of unwrap that riddle and puzzle. Uh, so that's really what we're here to talk about today. In the process, we'll end up touching upon uh, urban form. We'll touch upon how uh, the, the language has been used to describe some of these issues, how some of that language and some of those ideas have uh, stifled, in a sense, uh, innovation, and have influenced the way people think about low-income housing in general in ways that uh, have often not been very helpful. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And let me introduce uh, really what I think is an all-star uh, lineup here and, and thank them uh, for, for taking the time uh, to be here to think about these issues with us and for us. Uh, first is, is, uh, is a good friend of mine, uh, Michael Bell, who is a professor of architecture at Columbia University. He directs the Master of Architecture program uh, for the Port Design Studios. He's the author of several outstanding books. He's exhibited in world-renowned venues like MoMA, where we intersected, and it was an interesting thing for me. I'm a finance guy to uh, go to MoMA and uh, have a conversation there. It was uh, a treat for me, and I, and I credit him for it. Uh, you'll now know my lack of uh, Spanish speak uh, Spanish Italian speaking ability. Uh, the Ven Venice by any hour? Biennale. That's what I got. I should have got it. Biennale. It sounds so much better. Uh, he's taught here uh, as well. He's taught at MIT. He's taught at Rice. And he's the principal uh, of his uh, firm, uh, Visible Weather, which I love as a, as a title. Um, we also have with us Catherine Ingram, who is uh, a professor of architecture at the Pratt Institute. She chairs the graduate architecture program there. She's also authored a number of books. She's written more than 50 articles on architectural theory and history, won several design competitions, awards, and fellowships, and in the all roads lead through uh, Harvard for the elite architecture crowd. Uh, she's also taught here, uh, and she did a stint at Columbia, and you're going to see that it's a, it's a very incestuous world of elite architects, that's what I've discovered. Uh, there's a perfect, and then, uh, then uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, is, is our own uh, Sanford Quinter, who is just an amazing person for those of you who haven't uh, taken a course or listened to Sanford, uh, you're missing a, a real treat in life. Uh, right, you're, you're building this up too much. I'm right? building you up. I'm not getting really part of this. I'm the last <laughs> one and they've yeah, so got the ideas tonight. You're an expert on public health. <laughs> <laughs> he's now an expert on public health. I came down to make sure that I'd actually be no one stage. I'm very careful. That's why there's nothing. We also had an interesting conversation about gun control. But, uh, he's a professor of architecture theory and criticism here. He's a writer and editor of a lot, a lot of different publications, curated a lot of conferences, written a lot of books, uh, uh, over 150 articles in uh, many different languages. Uh, he also uh, taught at MIT uh, and at Columbia. So again, uh, I think these guys have all know each other quite well and uh, come up against each other in a lot of ways. But uh, Sanford's really an integrative thinker, and he draws on a really wide variety of fields of thought and study to bring a perspective. So we thought it would be good to have someone who wasn't part of the housing uh, world and thought process reflect on what we heard uh, from our two uh, uh, outside guests and, uh, and speakers tonight. So we're going to start right off with, uh, with Michael Bell. He's the one person who can give a slide projector. So when he's done projecting slides and giving his talk, uh, stay when you see us slide the table. That's not uh, an indication that we're leaving, but that it feels sort of funny to be talking stage, depends left or right, depending on which you are. We want to be stage center. So we'll do that as soon as Michael's done. Uh, and look at this, Michael. The moon is out for you. OK, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, but they're incredibly sincere. Um, as Sanford Quinter introduced me to Eric Felsky a little more than a year ago, and had said, you need to talk to Eric, and two would have a lot in common. And it, it, not only did Eric then call, and we did, it's just been an incredibly interesting conversation. I'm very honored to be working with you. 
Uh, Stanford and Catherine, I've known you for years, and in fact, in uh, for all the years, I've been honored to talk about these issues with you tonight, too, so I think it's great that we're together. Uh, we might know each other too well to be spontaneous. Um, I want to try to, I, I have five points that I wanted to make, at least in the conversation, and uh, my wife teased me last night that it was five points like Le Corbusier, but it's, it's really seven. Uh, the project I'll show is also, the project that I am with is co-authored with Ben John Song, who's my partner in this project for the MoMA. Uh, I want to sort of backtrack for a moment. I came to housing as an architect, uh, and I, I became interested in the, some, some of the arcane aspects of housing policy and housing finance, and I spent time looking at them. I am an architect at the core, and my goal really is to sort of discover what's possible architecturally within when you know more about these things. Like, and like most, most Americans, uh, especially Americans my age, uh, I was raised in the 60s as, as a child, young child, but as a child, but well aware of the kind of things that uh, Eric is bringing up and thinking that I knew something about them, but of course then as you become more aware of the depth, you realize you don't know much at all. But this is a 1968 uh, cover of Time Magazine, John Lindsay is the mayor, the title of course, The Breakdown of a City, but uh, a huge amount of data here basically describing in a, in a relatively, seemingly conclusive way that that the city is in not only disrepair, but it's probably irreparable. Uh, the question of housing is part of this, and there's discussion of public housing, the amount of people coming in, et cetera. I bring this up because in 1968, also in a recently published uh, biography on, among other things, the Candilis of, Team, of Candilis Joseph Woods, but really Team 10, this beautiful text in the, uh, in the biography describing some of the internal criticisms that they were giving themselves in 68. So we go from New York to Europe, and you find Candilis and Alda Van Eyck basically finding within their own uh, practices a huge amount of self-doubt about the scale and the, the size of what they were working on. In the case of Toulouse, you're looking at housing for up to 20,000 people at that midpoint, and it's only halfway completed, and you find Candilis beginning to lose faith, not only in the central organization of what they were doing, but also in the amount of time it was taking to build it, but the fact that it may become obsolete by the time it was done. So in this kind of scenario, if you, if you again, are you of my generation, you're educated in architecture, there's a, a kind of specter of these properties, the cities in the United States, certain characteristics of them, a relationship that you would have academically to prototypes in Europe. But then when you start to scratch the surface, and as this is really a kind of retroactive education for myself, to understand the current situation, Eric was referring to Hope Six, you begin to look a little more closely and you see the story is, of course, never so simple. New York City, one in 12 people in the year 2000 lived in public housing. It's more than 8% of the rental housing in New York City is public housing. 189,000 public housing units. And in 1937, when public housing is founded, funded in 34 through the Wagner Stagel Act, New York City receives, I believe, almost half of the original federal funding. So you begin to just scratch the surface of these things and, and as an architect, wonder how you'll deal with them. The issue that I would lead to tonight is three projects where over the last 15 years I've had an engagement with trying to design affordable housing, what would have been called public housing under different regimes and eras, and coming at this in a way that I'll try to retroactively describe as related to the history of public housing and some questions around urbanism. This is a site in Far Rockaway, New York. It, it, this is a photograph from just before the year 2000. It recently has been redeveloped. But in the image, you're seeing 308 acres of property that was cleared in 1968. So we have three moments here in 1968. The property was cleared in 1968. In 2001, it was still vacant. When it was cleared, as one of the last, and forgive the term if, if it seems overly difficult, it's a real term, in, in the last act of slum clearing in New York, the argument was that as many as 10,000 units of low-income housing would be built on this site. By the year 2000, the RFP, the RFQ that went out as one of the last pieces of the Giuliani administration was for 1,800 units of high-income housing. And they, in fact, were built and sold. And you might know the project, somebody here might have worked on it. Uh, the site was owned by the New York Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, better known as the HPD. The HPD was the organization founded, I believe, in the 60s. I should know that better myself. But it was a nascent organization in its beginning that was devoted to issues of preservation and housing. It became a default receivership for a huge amount of property in New York as, as tax issues and the city's economy slumped. 
I believe by 2000, by the year 2000, they were holding as much as $2.5 billion worth of property. <clears throat> the property was surrounded by New York City Housing Authority, Mitchell Lama, cooperative housing at the New York State level, and the Urban Development Corporation, another form of quote unquote public housing at the New York State level. And then the land was held by the HPD. I'll show more of that later. But 30, more, 30 or more years of a stalemate before it got redeveloped. Another small site, this is Bridgeport, Connecticut, in the year about 2005, you're seeing a set of single family houses that were built to be rental public housing. The middle was supposed to become a higher density form of public housing. Protracted lawsuits between the city of Bridgeport and HUD led to a stalemate as well. And for 10 years, you've had 20 open acres in the middle and the city wishing they could eradicate what is single family rental housing. I show all of this and I'll go into more detail with my own projects to show a kind of protracted period of time where these issues, and I'm sure many people here know these issues as, as well as any of us, are in a kind of stalemate and where the policy around redevelopment, the policies and the ways architects imagine these things is in a, is, I would argue, in a, often in a kind of superficial debate about architectural styles. And eventually, you know, without wanting to critique new urbanism, I'd like to argue eventually that I think new urbanism has essentially glossed over a deeply complex issue. It is, however, perhaps a valid answer to some of the issues. It just has kept others from being involved. Um, I can't vouch for the 100% uh, accuracy of this. I worked on it with a student. Uh, not that that would make it inaccurate. Um, that would, of course, make it more accurate. Um, but uh, it's not something that I compiled by myself, so I'm not a thousand percent positive it's as uh, accurate as I would like to imagine before I present it. But the trends are there. Eric was mentioning low-income housing tax credits, LIHTC. Uh, coming, on to, coming online in the 1980s, you can see a dramatic rise in low-income housing tax credits as, as a public housing vehicle. You can also see HUD rental assistance in the red line rising. And in fact, you can see an overall rise in the way HUD is affecting housing in general. The idea that public housing monies in the U.S. are diminishing is arguably a great myth. There is a huge amount of money flowing through the federal government towards public housing, but it's not flowing towards the construction of hard units, which is a PHA term for me, a unit that the federal government builds, owns, and operates, which is what the first housing was. Um, so you can see a decline. The blue line is other housing assistance. That's one of the ones I would rather not present because I don't understand it. The one I do understand well is public housing. Under the Clinton administration, public housing uh, dropped 56,000 units, I believe, between 1996 and the year 2000. These are hard units. But you will see a decline from about 1.3 million hard public housing units to about 1 million over a decade. And this is largely the effect of Hope 6. My first take on some of these things was to begin to digest information. And it was particularly the information in the 1996 around the formation of Hope 6 and 1998 around the Quality Work and Housing Responsibility Act. And I put together an exhibition where I invited 16 architects to try to respond to shifts that, I, that were happening quite dramatically under the Clinton administration. I'll back up, I thought I had two slides of that. The 16 architects were asked to respond to a dossier of material. They developed a house that was trying to comprehend some of the issues and then we displayed the houses in the fifth ward in Houston, Texas, where we were working, I was then at Rice, and we displayed the work in a nonprofit gallery in the neighborhood where the houses would have been uh, sited. The Clinton administration, and again, depending on who we're working with tonight, uh, you would know these things, the Quality Work and Housing Responsibility Act of 1998 not only established new protocols for work in public housing, it had a startling phrase in it, at least to an architectural mind, of, of an ability of a public housing authority to quote unquote deconcentrate poverty in a housing development if it could demonstrate the ability to house somebody of a different income somewhere else. The goal was to create more of a heterogeneous population in terms of income and demographics and to create ultimately the euphemism or the, the more popular term mixed income. The second act uh, in the Clinton administration that Eric was referring to as Hope 6, which allowed public housing authorities maintenance funds and renovation funds, but in lieu of gaining those funds, a public housing authority would diminish the amount of public housing and instead replace it with a higher quotient of higher income housing, thus creating the capability of mixed income. I thought those things were startling, and this is now, they are now, of course, somewhat commonplace. Hope 6 is well known. New Urbanism's official relationship to Hope 6 is extremely well known. 
uh, Andres Dewani signed, and Elizabeth Pleasure Zyber signed documents with Henry Cisneros, uh, making it the language. And uh, it was, it's something that is debated endlessly of, is this the, is this the way to go? Sanford is on the screen right now. One reason I'm glad he's here is that I think if you look back again away from policy and more towards theory for a moment, this is a little argument that got, a major argument I should say, that got played out in the public press between Sanford and Michael Hayes in the middle 1990s through any and through a Columbia publication, Introduction to Architecture and Theory since 1968. Without going into it in any depth, Sanford is arguing that we need to become part of infrastructure. Uh, quote, anyone who still relies on the efficacy of negative dialectics is gullible, uh, and that we need to basically find ways to work within the systems. To me, this was always a kind of endorsement of the, the pre-formal and understanding the operational aspect of things. Michael Hayes, in concluding the, in his acknowledgments for the Columbia publication, uh, which they're part of one of two books that were published in Columbia on theory since the 60s, but uh, Hayes su suggesting that a younger generation may have such an altogether different relationship to commodity practices and quote unquote markets that they're not going to be that easy to convince that negative relationships or resistance is the way to go. Now, a terribly simple summary, but I think when an architect enters into some of these questions that are obviously not only deeply complex politically, policy-wise, financially, racially, socially, one of the roles is of course to take on an advocacy role where you would possibly overcome the status quo and provide some kind of uh, medicinal work, perhaps. I think that is obviously a complex story in itself, but if you go back to, I think, most of our educations, and here's a passage from Rafael Maneo writing about that his then mentor, Aldo Rossi, he's saying Rossi has an altogether, has, has had to adopt a quote-unquote evasive relationship to broader urban technologies to secure the authority of architecture in the post-war city. Rossi is, quote, deliberately forgetting the framework of the real, even at levels as evident in compromise as the technological, end quote. I put that up there because at this period of time from 68, and 68 keeps showing up, establishes, you know, in a broad way, not only, a, I think, a stalemate, but a role in which architects, of course, become deeply suspicious of top-down politics, of forms of power that apparently began as beneficiary sources of goodwill, and perhaps then have other uh, out, effect, out effects, but they begin nonetheless and obviously want to be constructive. Rossi's uh, Teatro del Mundo, Floating Fruit, Venice Biennale, I think in 1982. But of course that making possible, and I hate to hang this on Aldo Rossi because he doesn't deserve it by any stretch of the imagination, but the neo-vernacular and the kind of look back, I think the 1982 Venice Biennale was in fact titled The Presence of the Past. A kind of moment where in this fracture around Toulouse in looking at New York in this kind of dangerous lens that one begins obviously to look back to a better time. This is a public housing project in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's been given a sloped roof. It's about to get new windows. It doesn't yet have siding. But of course, new urbanism does directly take on the architecture and it directly takes on the symbolic and psychological qualities that modern architecture had gained at that point in time. That's really where I enter this. And over the years, I've done three projects that try to address this through an architectural lens. I've been the curator or research person on all three of them, as well as a designer. First one, 1998, Houston, Texas, uh, a neighborhood called the Fifth Ward on the northeast corner of downtown Houston. The average household income was $7,700. There were 6,000 households in the Fifth Ward. I'm sorry, 6,000 people in the Fifth Ward. Uh, the little neighborhood next to Rice, the incorporated city of University Village that year had an average household income of $155,000. Disparity in incomes is, of course, nothing shocking. But the Fifth Ward had within it uh, the beginnings of not Hope Six, but of community redevelopment corporations and monies that were streaming towards localized redevelopment. The Fifth Ward CRC was founded by the Reverend Harvey Clements, who also ran, ran the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, and he began a process of building houses in a nonprofit way for people who would qualify for a then new down payment voucher through HUD. You could qualify for a $9,500 down payment on a house and the agency would take you through a purchasing uh, system to get you into the house. The computer has frozen up. There we go. So 
in that scenario, this was a new public house. This house would have sold $55,000 in 1998. You would have a $9,500 voucher, and you would then establish a 30-year mortgage with credit, uh, with credit approval, of course. We were looking at that in the context of other expenditures in Houston. That year, Houston, I believe, had $1.4 billion in new freeway contracts. They paid directly for $181 million for 8.1 miles of a freeway in Houston. And the voucher program, 25,000 down payment vouchers, which were projected to be available to the city of Houston, were valued at $225 million. Now, the next side of the question, so what does that tell you? Highways are productive, maybe housing isn't. But I was beginning to assemble a lot of data and information to try to prompt architects to get interested in this. The next question was, if you bought a house in, at that price, you would have a 30-year mortgage of approximately $352 a month. If you sold it at nine years, which was the average sale time of a house in Houston, you would have accrued about $5,000 in equity for $32,000 in expenditure. The amortization of interest, obviously, quadratic and the, bond and the mortgage not. Could you just the final conclusion, bottom line? The bottom, the bottom line of, of, the, of, the, of the distributed system, and this is where I'll go ahead to a project if it helps. The $225 million was understood to be better if it was distributed into the bloodstream of the, of the market commodity method of producing houses. When you produce houses in the United States at the developer level, architects are not involved. So what we were looking at was the method by which the disaggregation of the large top-down sum of money into the bloodstream of the housing market was this a good thing? It was a reaction to the top-down planning of, of former public housing, but it essentially meant, one, the end of architects involved with housing. There are, of course, architects of Hope 6 housing. But it, in this way, they're not here. And secondly, it meant essentially that you were entering into what at that point in time was a pretty low-level commodity, meaning the house. One project in the exhibition done by Mark Wommel and Don Finley proposed keeping the $225 million as an aggregate sum producing an element that would clip together elements that were made by other highly capitalized companies such as Hebrew, Coca-Cola, or Ford. My own work in that show tried to take a various, the various set of low-level commodities that were part of all Houston and spec houses, sliding doors, aluminum windows, four-inch slab on grade, and to try to build a kind of complex spatial experience that would hint at the commodity market that was ubiquitous in housing and some of the high-level elements but to find a new architecture that might situate this new subject in the midst of that. The voucher systems emerged in the 1990s as a way, basically, to still move large amounts of federal money towards housing and the poor, but basically to do it through a quasi-privatization. And the issue that I'd like to end with really tonight is saying that that quasi-privatization means that all housing ends up essentially as a financialized practice, and as such, the, left, the issues, whether they're left, or right, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, are all filtered through the same adjudicated form of finance, and the architectural product really is basically normalized. Um, the pictures that went through this project, uh, Darren Neville was a photographer in the Fifth Ward. We asked him, I asked him, to try to capture this kind of disjunction between a high-end commodity, in this case a great new computer, versus a ramshackle house or something made by hand versus, of course, the Shell logo and the real economy of Houston that this thing has not taken part in. The second version of this question would be operate at a much larger scale. Far Rockaway, New York, which I have shown you a moment ago, an image, a, a map image and an aerial photograph, the 11 mile long peninsula, the 11 mile long peninsula of, the, of Queens, the Far Rockaway Peninsula is 38,000 households, 13,500 of them are publicly subsidized. It's the highest concentration of poverty in New York City, not Harlem, not the South Bronx. The, this site was an incredible site, a zone of various histories of public housing, but by the 1990s and the 2000s, it too had become a low scale version of quasi private nonprofit builders, no architecture. Looking at the peninsula, you can find huge discrepancies between race and income, 220% at the white end in the, pre, in the ponds at the breezy point, 20% in the looking area of public housing, the commuting costs, uh, turning the peninsula into a soft prison, aspects of the, of the history of the public housing policy and law. We were asked to propose a way in which that site could be redeveloped 
acknowledging the market goals of fixed income without cutting off the other histories. And I can talk about that maybe during the conversation on the Gallagher bill. I'd like to move ahead because time is incredibly short and give one last glimpse of, a, of another project. The project that I met Eric about during last year was at the Museum of Modern Art, foreclosed rehousing the American Dream, curated by Barry Bergdahl and Reinhold Martin. We were asked to look at Temple Terrace, Florida, a small city of, uh, of 22,000 people adjacent to Tampa. Temple Terrace began as an orange grove and 88 houses. If you, owned orange, if you owned stock in the orange grove, you would also own property and vice versa. It became a suburb over time, and by 2010, it looks like every other suburb in the United States and is, of course, suffering from the same kind of problems. Temple Terrace had entered into a public-private partnership in which the city raised taxes for four years to acquire 225 acres adjacent to the corner of Tampa, which they were going to offer to a developer at a very low cost to develop this new urbanist downtown. They had two proposals uh, for the project. They chose one of two, and they began working on it when the markets crashed in 2008. Our project looked at this and in trying to understand the scale of Temple Terrace, three Temple Terraces will equal Manhattan, five and a half Central Parks. But the questions, which I can be more precise in the conversation, extremely low density, 2.5 people per house, five, uh, five, uh, I'm sorry, five people per acre, 2.5 people per houses. Uh, and I don't know, we'll maybe do this more in detail later. To look at this, we actually analyzed the entire city budget and came up with a new idea of a real estate investment trust where the city would hold the property in a new trust and would actually own the development. We were looking at ways to re-centralize the city's investment and to find a way through market practices that we could, in a sense, reverse what we saw as a 30-year trend towards what was a federal project becoming more of a private project. And to try to reverse a trend that, that government cannot do things as well as the market. The argument was that the market in housing is, is not the public obviously. Not many foreclosures in Temple Terrace. A great deal of foreclosures on the border with Tampa and in the newly converted apartments, the condominiums. Our proposal took uh, that 225 acres and the benchmark investment the city was to make and tried to reallocate it along the scene and to show that we could develop a new high density form of housing that was funded through the city's revenue that could essentially fill this gap in housing needs and hopefully prevent the kind of actions of foreclosure in the future. The last point I'd really like to show is this project really became not a question of public housing at all. And what it became was a question of suburbs trying to find their futures, but of questions of how does the housing market work when architects are not involved? How can you look at the public-private partnership and try to recalibrate it? And how can you try to recalibrate a sense where what I, what I would say is a, a form of an anti-ideology where people are quite sure what they don't want government to do but they haven't yet come up with an alternative. So in looking at those kind of things, this is the housing footprint. That's the amount of asphalt that supports that many households. That's our proposal for re-inhabiting this zone, not taking away any private property. This is all underutilized public property. And then finally developing a new hybrid system that was done with Transolar Arab and others to try to produce a newer form of architecture that could produce all sorts of efficiencies and could be capitalized at a level that would allow you to actually engineer it to perform in ways that could dramatically change the cost of living for single families and individuals. And images of that as an architectural sequence. I'll leave it at that. It's too much for 20 minutes. No, that's fine. So we're going to slide the table over in just one second. Catherine's going to speak. But let me just uh, point out a couple of things. So should, leave this on for one second, Michael. So. What Michael was trying to do in this project was basically say, you know, looking at the actual finance and what it would take to achieve this, could I come up with something quite different that would both not be privately owned but publicly subsidized, but actually publicly owned, but be something very different? So show that one more time, what you came up with. And the actual uh, model you know, the, of the uh, units themselves, the actual models were quite impressive. They involved having uh, uh, civic space, uh, uh, commercial space, residential space, in a really dramatic uh, environment, energy saving, operating costs <laughs> taken into consideration. And now go back to the one that they were planning on doing. 
And so part of the question we're going to throw out at some point in this is, why not that? Why and uh, is the this, which is the, you know, just so conventional looking uh, model. And then the other thing I just want to point out, just to underscore, is what Michael was saying when he was looking at the Fifth Ward, was that the way the capital was deployed in the market basically and was financed and the idea of down payment assistance just supported the notion of a single family home built to a certain uh, density, built with a certain uh, amount of, of money to be spent, and again in a very kind of conventional way, but sort of forcing uh, the architecture into a space that it could do something creative with, which he did by showing other architectural visions, but the easier thing was just to make a single family house of a particular kind. So this is the alternative, and I would put it to you that when I saw the other one, I was much more interested in the other one than I was in this one, and yet you could do the same kind of financing uh, and actually create a longer term uh, preservation and affordability situation because it would be the government that would be the steward of that uh, rather than uh, depending on the market again to come in, private market and recapitalize the project at some point. So with that, we're going to slide the table over so we're a little more central since those are the slides we're showing. We'll take a quick question. Sure. Two loose ends. Two loose ends. What, what in the high density, what has actually happened? The, the project is sponsored by the museum, so it wasn't sponsored by the city, so at this point nothing is happening. But it was one of five projects that we show at the moment all last year. Um, the, the identity density question, and I think it's already about 40 years in it, but the density question, which I'd love to take on more in the conversation period, the growth, we tried to actually take the population, which was 22,000 people, and proposed that it could come up to 32,000. The city had an aggregate personal income of $714 million. We were proposing that it could get up to $1 billion. And that, that if you could, instead of atomizing personal income into single family houses, if you could find a way of reproducing the privacy and some of the other issues that people cherish in single family houses, but collectivize the wealth, you could engineer and afford a far more sophisticated building. And I think this, in terms of energy questions going forward, it's a big question because you know it's a big issue that we can get into, but it is around you know the scale at which you do things, and when you do them as, as atomistic things and you do them on their own lots, uh, there's a lot that's lost that you can gain if you do it in a, in a in a more densely settled way and in a connected way, and that's especially true when it comes to energy performance of these structures. Um, so the next speaker, as I said, is Catherine Ingram, who is a professor at the Pratt Institute, who's going to talk a little bit about her uh, effort to try to think about these issues and conceptualize the issues around housing and design in this space. So with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Sanford first. I, do you count like those two-page afterwords in your number of articles you've written? I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, yeah. I want you to count the notes. Any afterwards? Um, the um, it's very strange, actually, in a sense, to be here talking about what I'm talking about today because it's not. Um, I mean, I'm incredibly interested in what. Michael's, you know, Eric are doing, and I'm incredibly interested in these, uh, in the problem of public housing and architecture. I'm deeply coming at that question from the architecture side, not because I've been doing uh, <clears throat> what Michael has been doing for many years and is sort of an exemplary, uh, in an exemplary way, has been trying to grasp the relationship between. Uh, statistics, data, uh, trends, uh, uh, legislation, governance, uh, housing, uh, uh, settlements, and all sorts of theory and theories of settlement and so forth, and to put them together in a way with an architectural, with an architectural problem. Um, architecture is radically trapped, in a certain sense, by an autonomous language <coughs> of its own which is also extremely fertile, very rich, it's been historically venerable. So the problem in a way is sort of to break architecture out of its autonomous sort of self-focusing, yet you cannot, you cannot 
uh, take it out of that 100% because then you don't have architecture anymore. You have something else. You have, you know, you have aesthetics, really, or aesthetics plus construction. Uh, <clears throat> so you have, there's a, some extremely fine uh, and complex territory between architecture and, uh, and questions of public housing, but also, and I've been working on the relationship of architecture to property. And I started with property, not with public housing, because it's a, a huge issues of public housing are, uh, uh, ex in, in some sense, extremely local. Uh, whereas what I wanted to find out was how architecture and property kind of negotiated the, the terms that they either come into with each other. Inevitably, in modern world, architecture has to go into a property system and how it goes into that. So that when we get to the problem of property in public housing, or the problem of ownership, or the problem of the disposition of densities of uh, living, or the city of you know, urbanization, or whatever the other contemporary issues are, uh, how does the, how does property and architecture, how does the relationship between property and architecture kind of well up the, into, that, into that specific problem of public housing? Um, it's not specific, it's not one problem as we've seen, it's a multiplicity of issues. So, um, so I've become very interested in this relationship between architecture and property. And it's actually started out in a fairly general way. I just sort of asked the question, so uh, what happens there when architecture you know, has to build a building in the midst of a property system? And what does it do? Uh, the first thing is that um, the contract, for, uh, uh, the contract between architects and developers, for example, and in fact the typical contract of an architect with a client um, rarely mentions the word design. It mentions architectural services, which are the things that are calculable, you know, the costs and so forth. The calculable aspects of the transaction are uh, mentioned in great detail. And then there's this strange uh, thing, you know, that we all in architecture are constantly referring to called design, and we know that it's a, a territory of both the in-depth historical kind of significance, but also vague and subject to style, style and you know, and uh, and. Uh, 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 the development of typologies and so forth, and that has all of this terminology associated with it. But that part is left, in a certain sense, unspecified in the contract uh, between architecture and, uh, and, say, a developer who is financing an architectural building. So um, that seems to me um, interesting, and so I wanted to, in, in a certain sense, you know, is it, is it a, a case that architecture is, has become so introverted, so involuted, that it now uh, can't even state what design means anymore in calculable terms, can't give a price to it, can't really, uh, can only manage to, sque you know, to squeeze it into the contracted architectural services, whatever they are, and that, uh, and that the, the desperate kind of frenzy of architectural work where you're rolling projects over in order to even make a living um, and uh, trying, to, uh, trying to put something across to another system, to the system of the, built, the building in the world, to put something across into that that is, you know, that we understand to be architectural. Um, and which is, uh, you know, so it's an extraneous, obviously, kind of ex excessiveness of some kind that you want to convey through the various symbolic vocabularies of the discipline and so forth. So that's still pretty theoretical and abstract, but, it, um, but what it got me into was the looking at property pretty closely and going into property law and all the rest of it because it, um, because I, you know, I, the last time I visited the issue of property, it was basically reading, to, in architecture, it was reading to Fourier, reading the Marxist uh, theorists who were essentially, you know, a, a property was, uh, was the uh, downfall in a certain sense of Western democracy. It was the, you know, it was what opened the door to capitalist um, exploitation, commodification, and so forth, so that... Property or private property? Well, that's another point that I just... I discovered that there's no property but private property in a sense. That the, that the 
that property functions as private property in almost all uh, cases, and when it is, is rendered as public property, it loses definition and has to be recomposed and reformed at every moment as a pu as it, and the, the idea of public property is a kind of uh, formation that, that changes in almost every circumstance, that it's very hard to fix the meaning of public property. Uh, public property, if public housing, for example, is um, publicly subsidized private housing. People live in their house. They rent it. You know, they're living privately. They're not living in the public space. They're not living in the plaza. They're not living in the, I mean, the interesting case of the homeless people where the public space is familiar living space is very unusual and, you know, highly idiosyncratic. Mostly people live privately in their houses. And so the subsidy becomes the problem. Why is the subsidy, how does it render the political citizenry or identity of the people in the private, you know, living privately, how does it render them public? Um, and so the category of the public, I think, is just gets, is very tricky. And, uh, and all the, the, the fascination of the, I, I mean, of the world of finance, the, the benevolence of government, you know, the desire to help people uh, come into a kind of a balanced relationship to their, you know, to their enclosures, to their, to their living conditions, is is genuine and it, to some degree, you know, filled with imaginative and creative financial instruments that are constantly trying to recalibrate the relationship between uh, the public and the private and the and the, the you know the the government financing and the that type of house that you can get and so forth. Uh, so uh, that and that recalibration is incredibly creative. I think. I mean, it's just unbelievably. It's interesting that there's any number of possible combinations of the public and private that you could co concoct in a certain way financially, in order to uh, enable or to privilege different aspects of uh, each side of the. Uh, the various sides of the equation, privileging the developer, the privileged tax incentives for homeowners, and so forth. Um, that the financial structure is a really uh, powerful instrument. Um, so, but I was trying to even, I mean, I was, I've, I've been um, thinking about this in different ways, and uh, one um, thing that came to mind was that um, why, I mean, this question that Eric actually originally posed. We, you know, we, as he said, you know, we set up a tax incentivized system for um, for publicly subsidized housing, and uh, we expected architecture to jump into that and do something really innovative, and uh, and it was actually meant to incentivize entrepreneurial um, architecture and uh, and innovative architecture, and some of that. Uh, some of it, uh, some of that, uh, inspired uh, uh, new urbanist participation and new urbanism was something of a disappointment in the sense that it became sort of formulaic and it also seemed like a throwback to some other era of architecture. It wasn't contemporary, in other words. So maybe we could even say contemporary architecture has a very special place in in this discussion versus, let's say, the you know the the the, the platitudes of architectural style that we're all, all too familiar with. So how do you, what would it mean to do a contemporary, well, such as, you know, Michael's design is a contemporary architectural proposal, um, Michael and EJ. Uh, so uh, it seems pretty, I'm gonna say something now that probably everybody already just, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, well, we already know that, uh, and so what, what of that? Uh, but um, I wanna say, what I would say is that the trouble is not does not rest in a um, does not rest in uh, legislation per se or financial instruments per se, because financial instruments typically follow uh, another relationship between architecture and property, or between um, you know housing and the housing projects and the taking of housing projects and turning them into something other than just the barracks that they, they started with, turning them into, you know, a, a kind of something that participates in 
citizenry or sovereignty or, or private life or whatever it is that housing does, you know. And um, so I began to think that um, the difference between the way architecture would look at public housing and the way that um, uh, at property looks at public housing has to do with um, the treatment of enclosure. Uh, that property treatment of enclosure is a legal treatment in the sense that property is one of the most ab you know, it's completely abstract. It's a, a designation of a boundary condition enclosure, but it's a it's a it's enclosure of rights and uh, and uh, rights to what happens in a certain way, or you know, it uh, controls access to. Uh, space but it considers this it, it does not consider the space it's a legal instrument and in fact property unlike possession is um, is specifically entitled possession it's possession that can be legally defended uh, and that's a crucial that's different that's why when we look at systems like Native American systems or something there's there's possession you know possession systems and even private property systems in those kinship, what we call kinship systems, but there isn't uh, a legal structure that it makes these relationships to property enforceable. So property, contemporary property systems are, it's about enforceable, en enforceable and exclusivity essentially, where you, uh, you are able to legally defend your right to uh, own something. And it's, it's not called, it's not a thing, property. Property is, a, is typically defined in property law as a set of relations between people with regard to things, which is why when we talk about property, we're always using kind of sociological terms because law is about relationships between people. And, uh, and so the legal part of uh, the legal uh, definition of property and the way in which property is related to law actually makes of you know, any legislative or sovereign or governing governance kind of uh, uh, treatment of that problem uh, makes, you know, turns it into a sociological discussion in a certain sense about people's behavior and predictability of what people expect and income, you know, statistics is our current way of profiling different income groups and so forth. Um, architecture, on the other hand, uh, seems to me takes property literally in the sense that it looks at property and it says, this is spatial enclosure. This is, this is actually a theory spatial enclosure. And I'm going into this property system, and this property system is uh, uh, ask, showing me the boundaries that within which I can build, and it's also defining those boundaries in a very particular way. And, those ba and it's trying to make a certain case for the what, how much of that boundary condition is going to operate on the design. It's also going to make lots of determinations about the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, economy of occupying that space in a particular way and so on. Because that's how property value is determined. It's determined by that relationship between boundary and occupation and the economics of that in a marketplace and so forth. Um, and so, but architecture doesn't doesn't treat space as a question of legality or enforceability. It does treat space as bounded, and, and that's, there's a long tradition now, going back to invention of perspective representation, all sorts of other venerable traditions of that. Uh, so, uh, so the, um, in any, so that when, when architecture greets the problem, public housing, it can't, the word public there is very complex for it. Because for one thing, there's no um, buddy to go meet with uh, around the question of the occupancy of that, you know, that project. So you go and you meet with a developer who is representing the occupancy in these legal sort of economic terms, or you go and meet with a federal authority who is trying for some sociological uh, improvement of the balance between the rich and the poor, or you go and meet with a community group, which has really typically been, not in all cases, but has been organized uh, out of lack of power, to, around the problem of lack of power over the immediate present condition of living in that space, 
and is therefore, in a certain sense, arguing against everything because it, it's about a, a, it's a power, it's a power a vacuum there. And so the architect is then left with this kind of amalgam. And I, I don't mean to idealize the architect, architecture. You know, architecture is filled with uh, all sorts of types and all sorts of questions and all sorts of export, you know, people that exploit the situation and people that are also not even listening and so forth. So it's, I don't mean to say the architect is this kind of hero. But um, there is a fundamental disconnect, it seems to me, between enclosure, spatial enclosure taken literally property taken literally, and then prop all of property's relations to, uh, to finance, to sovereignty, to all these other, other things. And that that causes uh, this way in which architecture only, in a certain sense, drop all the data and concentrate on the spatial problem. Or, in like the case of Michael's work, try to incorporate data into uh, trying to sell it. In a certain sense, to simulate architecture as cognizant of the other dimensions of the <coughs> of, of property's uh, desire to you know optimize that the use of that enclosure in a particular way. So this is very interesting. I'm going to turn to Sanford in a moment, but Catherine's laid on the table this notion of property, and in a sense, it's a bundle of rights, an abstract, a very definite bundle of rights that are legally enforceable, uh, sometimes extra legal kind of things develop in kinships and family relationships. And if the architecture approaches this thing really as a spatial enclosure, of course, the property owner has to think of it in both ways, but is in the driver's seat because of that ownership, even if it's a public uh, investment in it, and has to, in a sense, sell that uh, not only to the, to the uh, community, but also has to think about how people are going to occupy that space and how they're going to make a profit in the middle of doing all of this, even though it's 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 a publicly funded uh, uh, reduction in the amount of rent that someone's going to have to pay. And, and you layered into this notion that you have the ownership of the property, but then of course the tenants have a form of lease right and 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 the recognition of their privacy and their private rights to what is sitting on a public, in theory public, even if it's public housing is very private and very respected and part of the notion of domestic uh, space and is recognized in the law as something that is there as well as have the police right. So you've laid on a lot of complicated things and I want to, uh, and, and on top of the financialization practice idea that, 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 that Michael talked about but that it didn't have to be a straitjacket, you could actually have that financialization and come up with something different. But the developer who thinks of this as property isn't necessarily inclined to do something that's interesting and different and iconic. They're interested in doing something that looks bland the same. <laughs> you know, in a sense, it's something that they may think is easier to sell and they can more quickly get their capital out of the return. So with that, let me turn it over to you. Let me first say that, uh, and I want to be absolutely clear that uh, I was invited here as a uh, to provoke, not necessarily to make sense. And uh, I'm not sure I'm going to make sense, but I have, uh, well, yeah, everybody's a bit familiar with housing. I mean, nobody can claim to be completely innocent, um, or certainly not even close to an expert, but everybody knows about the failures, uh, and everybody feels a little queasy, a little uneasy at least, about the so-called claimed successes of uh, public housing, et cetera, et cetera. But, Listening to first to Catherine, um, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think perhaps I mean I'm wondering. You know, I mean, in a way, the part genealogy of the concept of property it follows certain lines of reasoning, which I think you are very highly trained in back in the Johns Hopkins days. But correct me if you object to this idea. Um, and I mean by that the um, the tendency to a certain kind of hermeneutic. Um, Analysis we associate with the school of Derrida. And I don't mean to, 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 to brand it with that, but it, it's typical in a certain kind of way to discover inside of a word um, a profound sort of density in which multiple meanings, but especially contradictory ones, begin to, uh, begin to proliferate. And the closer one looks, the more one is essentially trapped in a spiral of interrelationships, etc. And in a certain sense, there's a doom real vortex in there. And I felt in a certain sense that the analysis of property, of the private, etc., um, 
in a sense, was beginning to spin a kind of a vortex around us. Now, I, I want to ask a question about this. First of all, listening to your, I mean, of course it was perhaps, uh, you know, unrealistic to hope in 20 minutes to actually hear where your work on property goes in terms of the genealogy. But where does the idea of property begin? You use the word enclosure, and two things I think of. One was my own personal uh, history in which, uh, as growing up in Canada, we were all indoctrinated, you could say, but certainly um, educated with one of Canada's only great cultural achievements was in avant-garde cinema. There was a famous film that I think everybody in the United States would have seen at some point in their lives called Neighbors. And it was the story of two sweet um, men, uh, one of whom had a beautiful flower. No one, you don't know this thing, and eventually, you know, the other guy, the neighbor's admiring it, and they love it, and everybody's getting along fine, but he sort of wants the flower. What happens is he starts looking at the flower too closely. First thing, and then the next thing that happens, of course, is they start building fences, and by the end of this beautiful eight-minute film or something, they're, they're killing each other. Now, um, the idea of the enclosure, where I remember it from, is... Uh, is in the theory about the commons. And I know you know a lot about this, much more than I do, but um, one of the ways we can, one of the ways we've inherited the idea of the commons um, in a sense has to do with that famous essay some decades ago called The Tragedy of the Commons, such that when there is public and shared um, um, assets, let's say, in a civic space, um, it's certain that abuses will entail and that the concept, if you like, the space of the commons will be destroyed by abuses, litigations, and all of the forms of So I, I'm sort of wanted to suggest that in a sense that there is a, there's all these doomed kind of um, ideas. Um, and I want to ask you guys if you think that ultimately there is a I mean, let me just say one other thing. There's also this idea, I don't know if it's current anymore, of the broken window theory. Um, and there is, to all of these ideas, of course, um, there is an aspect to how, uh, how community is formed or how it fails to be formed. Um, and it is something that seems, we don't really have theories of this. We don't really even have a quant science of it, and even though social science pretends to be in a certain kind of way. Um, is that the problem, the missing problem, that we, for example, Michael, when you decided to redistribute um, funds uh, and redistribute the massing, for example, of a public housing project by sending along a scene, for example, um, to what res in what respect does it um, Need to, to what respect does it fail to acknowledge the forces that will make it or break it, which is its capacity to form or protect um, or destroy the formation of community and social life? That's, that's I mean, it's really not just about housing people. It's no, about no, I actually, I was jumping on a few comments. The, the book 16 Houses, was the project, it, the subtitle was Building a Public's Private House, which, which reminds me of Catherine's statement, which because of this, you know, money that starts out privately becomes public, comes back to privacy, and, and that kind of situation. But the, I, I hate to talk about things generationally, but the, 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 the generation of school that I was part of, there was, a, I think, a large discrediting of a kind of sociological project where an architect would be the one who had some gifted hand or some gifted insight that could cull community where it hadn't existed. And I think, of course, federal government, among other places, turns to trying to make things more local and spontaneous because of that. So the CDC's Community Redevelopment Corporation, all of these things are something I never expected to learn about. I ended up working with one and being with them every day for two years. And they did. They had this unbelievable kind of regrowth within the Fifth Ward. They were successful. And you, could, you can't, the architecture, debatable, but there was success. Um, the New York scale is obviously completely different, and that's why I put them together, because at the, at the New York scale, you're suddenly developing housing for 20 or 30,000 people, and you're rerunning into the problems that Candelis and Joseph Woods run into. Uh, I, 
in that same period of time, it would be a big mistake not to point to the rise of landscape architects in urban issues or to the kind of project that you could say belongs to Stan Allen and Ben Ben Burkle, Carolyn Ben Bo Carolyn Bose, and others, a kind of distributed diagrammatic vectoral urbanism, whatever you want to character it, but a kind of breaking down of trying to work so sociologically around housing and instead work within urban infrastructures, which I think Stan, Carolyn, Ben, and others did beautifully. But the reason I bring all this up is that we struggled in that Florida project trying to find a scale that was not a megastructure. Liz, Liz Plater Zyberg looked at it and called it a megastructure one day during a visit. It was 35 feet tall. Um, it's, <laughs> it's tiny. <laughs> and when she left, I asked the kids who work with me, can we draw the Apple headquarters and the Pentagon? And I started trying to figure out how big it really was. That is a tiny little structure. But it, the reason it was, we made these very long experiential videos of it, trying to get back to what would ultimately be an architect saying, yes, you need information, yes, you need all of this data and money, and you need to become a business person of some sort, but in the end, there will be a kind of new space that will make or break it. We had little walkways that went through there. We designed for the sun shading. We imagined being 70 and needing to go to the dentist. We did all of those things that you do in any housing project, but the difference was, and this is really, if I had one big point tonight, it would be that that 30-year drive towards atomizing federal dollars into quasi-market distributed housing, a lot of merit to that. And the idea that the market will do better presenting, present, prevent uh, creating community and spontaneity than a government can. My father worked for the government building, I remember that really. Um, but I think we're looking for ways in which you could say that somehow you could collectivize the money and do something. And, Part of it was the, that amount of money, in this case, uh, almost $1.5 billion to build two, 225 acres of architecture. You could do better heating and cooling. You could make a, a, a house, for instance, if Renzo Piano built it, rather than pulpy homes. You, you could, you, if you could find a way to get a, a public to re-understand the capacity of public monies mm -hmm. without the fear of losing privateness. And, and the reason I bring all that up is that I really think in the end that the generation that's espousing BIM and parametrics, BIM and parametrics are a very heady group because they in fact allow you to work with the financialization of architecture. And apparently there will be a life raft on which architecture will float and maybe surf. I th still think there's a need to think, understand it all well enough so that you can in fact resist it and offer a different alternative. Thus the debate between you and Mike. And I think, you know, the, 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 uh, the notion of, uh, you know, community that you've introduced into this, I mean, I think this is the large missing element. You're talking about in all these cases that we're looking at, it, it spatial enclosure, wherever it is, it wasn't a single unit. The whole idea of super blocks was that there was a, an idea that there was an autonomy of architecture or determinism that would achieve something and then it would create this kind of community. It's the same inspiration behind new urbanism that you're going to create some kind of uh, more closely knit community, a more healthy community, a walkable community. And the question always is when you see something like Michael Design, what kind of community would it be? What actually influences that and is it ultimately successful? All these decisions, even in the private space, in the private market, ultimately are really being made by developers and other people and their image of what they think it's going to be, and then responding to how they perceive the market, uh, responding to what actually happens when it's out there. So I think part of the, re the reluctance to do some of these other things is they're not sure what it will actually end up creating in terms of a community, and the costs involved before you can get an answer, and the idiosyncratic nature of them just makes it so hard to get people excited about it, yet, we're not doing that experimentation and innovation that might lead to something that would be a much better outcome. We're sort of straightjacketed by, by all these kinds of things. So. But, um, well, I mean, what you say, I mean, the way you say the, the, um, that, the, you know, the Pruitt Igo, the modernist housing, which uh, failed uh, 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 spectacularly and we blew it up as a sort of end of modernism and so forth, all of which is incredibly interesting, but, uh, it seems to me that if you um, treat modernism as a kind of typological solution to public housing, which is what 
I guess we have been talking about it as for, you know, it, even in its failure, we say, okay, the typology of modernism was inadequate to, uh, you know, surveillance and being able to see your children and so forth, you're too high up, and all the various sort of explanations for why modernist housing failed. As you, you said, I think that, uh, you know, you know people that live in modernist housing that is like luxury apartments, so, and they don't have any trouble watching their children and so forth. So it's not the typology that is at fault, and in fact, I don't think modernism is one typology. I think modernism was capable of multiple typologies, but in a certain sense, modernism meant uh, and I, I sort of talk about this in terms of the skyscraper, that there's a, there was an entirely new relationship between architecture and property in modernism, which had to do with maxim using you know, the skyscraper to maximize the footprint, property footprint and to produce unbelievable amount of value in the building. The right. Seaford building was the most expensive building ever built. I just, you know? just want to jump in. It's a, one thing, it, go back to Sanford and then leave some time for questions. Wait, I have to answer yeah, Sanford's thing yeah, first about the Caribbean <laughs> thing or something. I, 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 I um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I mean the enclosures movement was, took, took arable agricultural land, this was in the 17th, uh, 16th century, uh, took the took uh, arable agricultural land and and into and took it into private ownership. It was formerly a common grazing land, and it was taken into private ownership, uh, sometimes by the uh, by the farmers themselves, and other times by uh, you know by uh, uh, people coming into from outside. And it was understood. It when it was about a three hundred year process, and it was understood to be. Uh, the beginning of the division between and uh, the private wealth and uh, private wealth for its own sake and uh, and and wealth uh, distributed on behalf of the public good. So in a way, it plays into a very serious that very serious uh, kind of uh, division between the between the uh, private and public property or private private property and the public good. Um, it's the beginning, I mean, most commentators say that's the beginning of that division. But uh, obviously it has all sorts of benefits as well, you know, in a certain sense, because the, you know, subsistence farming is uh, deadly and uh, dead end game. So in a way it allowed sort of investment to be made into agriculture that had uh, improvements and, uh, you know, improved methods of cultivation and so forth. But, you know, the thing about that, the vortex is um, I totally disagree with you in every way. Um, and I think that there's no vortex here. Um, and I don't think it's about vortex. I don't think it's about spiraling down in some, in, into some uh, multi-relational, impossible morass of oppositions and paradoxes and negativities and what have you. I don't think it's... I, I, I think it's actually extremely, uh, there's extremely precise things that can be said about what, you know, things that have happened and the, the relationship of finance to architecture and the relationship of architecture to its own autonomy and the relationship of uh, the kind of typologies and the management of typology that have, you know, altered uh, ways that people live in relations of architecture to power and politics and money and everything. So I, I don't think it's, a, I don't think there's a, I don't think it, it's, it's, it takes the shape of a vortex. Um, the Derridian, you know, there's gonna, are you going to the Derrida conference? No, I don't even know there was one, but what are, <laughs> one, 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 what, what are some of the, you don't want to go there, Sam. <laughs> I haven't gone in 30 years, but right. running down the street, right. a bunch of radians. I want to know. That'd be fascinating. Now, what are some? When I met Sanford, he was basically ready to the list, <laughs> <laughs> which is really, I think, what we're talking about. Yeah. 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 No, it's a pharmacy. You know, I mean, the, the very no. I mean, the, the audience here is not particularly interested in that. What are some of the? Uh, the I refer there the pharmacy to one well, of the famous. Well, that's what I'm doing. No, well, <laughs> let me ask you this. I you went done from. It before, no. but uh, when you talked just now about the commons, and I, it seemed to me that that was my hypothesis of where the origins of the modern concept of a private and of property may be found. I'm not sure whether you suggested that that was right or wrong, but um, you should perhaps 
suggest to us where some of those openings are in the um, in this analysis or this genealogy of property. Is the the commons is not then we're not doomed to the tragedy of the commons um, in let's say this postmodern um, post Fordist uh, world that we live in. Um, but rather, there's hope, and you were about to tell me that uh, I was entirely wrong to assume that you were saying that there really wasn't. So, what are some of the? But do we have time for for that? Uh, well, <laughs> and you have uh, three minutes to answer. Then I do want to make sure we leave time. So I want to I want to wrap up a little after eight. Don't leave time for questions from the audience. So can you do it? In th I know uh, we're going to leave everyone hungry for more, hopefully. But I want to hear the three <laughs> three to four minute kind of response. I could be both. Yeah, Michael, do you have an answer to that? I mean, I have, I have a kind of proposal, and the, but it's not a, it's not going to gratify this question, I don't think. But anyway, I'll say, I'll say it very quickly. That the, really the kind of, um, the important thing is that I mean, when we went off on the sort of typology of modernism, it's actually part of it that, in a way, if we stop thinking of typology as an as a mere aesthetic, and also typology as one thing, then you can begin to examine the way in which the interaction between uh, finance and architecture actually construct a very quite specific set of relationships between, uh, you know, enclosure and occupancy, or, you know, like how big rooms are, how wide corridors are, how, uh, how accessible the, the, uh, the, you know, the front yard is, et cetera, that you're actually, those are being negotiated and calculated from the financial side very precisely. And architecture, and from the architectural side, the spatial argument can also be made quite precisely. So if those are begin to be speak to each other in a certain way, or begin to work with each other, as opposed to the the way in which finance typically uh, argues for itself as a pragmatist practice, whereas in fact it's extremely speculative practice, uh, the um, that there actually is room for more speculation, and there's and there's infinite room for revision and restructuring of financial relationships of every kind. As we know, money is extremely fluid. So how that, how we cook up that relationship in different ways shouldn't just be settled at the level of the look of the building, is what I'm saying. That there's actually logics that can speak to each other in there. So Michael's going to have a quick word on this, and then we'll open up the question. Yeah. The, over 15 years of doing this kind of work myself, uh, I would argue that it has changed wildly in those 15 years. So an answer as to where an opening would lie is, I think, changes each time. No one would theoretically predict the foreclosure crisis of 08, the liquidity crisis. Um, the Hope 6 was a new thing 15 years ago. Now it's an old thing. It's remarkable how much changes. But Sanford, uh, I think the question is completely fair, at least from my point of view. What I think is extremely different now than 15 years ago is I would argue that, and I speak on behalf of really as an architect here, that the real estate market and the banking market did drive things over a cliff. And whether or not they are culpable or not culpable, it, I, it's beside the point. I think what is what at one level it shows, that's beside the point as far as I'm concerned here, I think what it shows is that what we called housing and a lot of what we call real estate had become really a kind of dead commodity in the Marxist sense of it and to the degree in which everybody was looking for ways of extracting or leveraging wealth out of it, and no one wanted to leave wealth in it, other than the person who lived in the dwelling. And therefore, interiority in that spatial envelope becomes literally a type of prison. Someone is drowning in what was supposed to be a liberatory device. And I'm looking at the water bottle, because it's you know, the topological bottle there. It's a Henry Moore water bottle. But I think, you know, as topology emerged as a kind of new idea, as a renewed idea in 90s architecture around Greg Lynn, Ben, and Carolyn, and countless others, myself included, a lot of people, you know, what it conflated was geometry and time. And if there's anything about markets, it's the time value of money and figuring out how to move the time value of money towards your advantage. The acceleration of that in globalization and the breaking down of interstate banking and all of these systems, which used to be relatively territorially stable, as they became territorially unstable, 
and all the assets embedded within them and the people embedded within them, you end up with this crisis that we, that we produce in our derivatives. But what, the reason I'm saying all this in the widest sense is, at this point in time, I would think that architects who can begin to see the space of all of that as a topological problem begin to be very gifted in being end planners, landscape architects, begin to be quite gifted in being able to offer something to banks, etc. cetera, who I would argue at this point in time are looking for a new asset where they can put money. Um, they will put money back into housing on the outskirts of Nevada, but not because they really want to. So I think what's different now is that opening, we might be able to help find, but it would be premature to know what it is. I think the, the foreclosure show at Obama got a lot of negative criticism, maybe deserved it. But, but I think what was brave about it, at one point during the project, Barry Bergdahl said, we want proposals, not criticism. And a lot of us you know, wanted to spiral into a Iridium hermeneutics. <laughs> and they do. Are you looking at me? Oh, I mean, <laughs> me. Yeah, but, 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 the, but the thing about your comment about Catherine Jordan, what I think is remarkable is that's going to be really valuable is the degree to which it starts to become a way for architects and planners to know more about it. And I mean, basically, when you start projecting rather than critiquing, it's really a completely different world. Maybe it is back to 1950. But anyway, my sense is that that, that that topological project that got so much footing around geometry and time is, in fact, the kind of, is, you know, is what hedge funds, in fact, do themselves. They do it with money rather than architectural surfaces, but they are experts at the role of time and the adjudication of time. And they, of course, then crashed it. Um, Rander Zobeck, the great structural engineer, says, you know, with his heavy German accent, we could never run something that badly and not, and not go to jail. But, you know, in terms of administering instruments that construct human life. Um, I think a long answer. So we're going to take questions. I just finally say that, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so many risks are taken by, uh, in the finance world. Uh, but there just aren't a lot of risks get, that get taken in this world, and and uh, and it's interesting to just uh, contemplate that. I think people have an understanding, or they think they do, of what the market wants, and often they're they're right, even though it may not be architecturally all that uh, interesting. Uh, but very few risks get taken. Very few developers decide, you know, who have the the property, uh, and they're thinking about what to do with it do something well, and sometimes if they do, the community just slap them right back anyway. So it's just something that's more conventional because that's what the community wants, and you know, in a sense, they have to work in that field of forces. Questions from, uh, from you? Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, I am going to speak from my experience. I live in public housing here in Cambridge. I happen to be president of the tenant council at a major development, um, uh, which doesn't mean an awful lot. Um, I could explain why, so don't anybody get excited. We do not have Derry Da over the entrance to our tenant council office, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, my first observation is I think a, a lot of you probably have very interesting and useful insights in the language that you're using. And I guess it's an all, you know, I'm sure it's been said a lot, but so it, I, I, I worry about saying it again and seeming to be just like everybody else who says things like this. But, if the language that you all use could be a language that could capture the insights that you have and yet also be accessible, that you could communicate to the people who actually live in public housing and are sometimes asked to make choices about design, that would be a, a good thing. And I'm, I'm not saying that you haven't achieved that. You know, um, and I especially like the, the comment about rediscovering what public collectivizing resources that the public can do in an era where we're heading toward increased privatization. Just a couple quick insights from my experience. We, by federal law, we get presented with, purportedly with choices about architects. Two sets of architects come and present to us, and we as the tenants, residents, have, there's like a point system, and we get, we get attributed points to, to who we prefer. Uh, we were offered a choice recently uh, at Jefferson Park, and overwhelmingly everybody chose one, and we ended up with the other. And that was interesting, and I just want to just put that on the table. There so are why were they having you? Uh, well, exactly. You end up so you end up feeling like well, this is a charade right. because they've already decided that this firm they've worked with in the past, right. and this is just complying with the bidding uh, regulations. But it was so overwhelming. What were the criteria that made? Uh, 
the inhabitants choose one? Uh, I think there had been uh, specifically bad experiences directly related to the, the architects who ended up being chosen, Formica tabletops, things like that that didn't, that le that the water leaked across, uh, real specific problems that we were told were taken into account in, during the evaluation. But anyway, that's, that's sort of one thing that can happen. Another thing, we have state public housing and federal public housing. The state public housing is completely underfunded, defunded in Massachusetts. Um, and so that housing, which was built to last for 100 years, is deteriorating. There's mold and all this other stuff. And there's no funding available. Right. So, it's, it's so, uh, so there's room for other questions. Let me get some yeah. reactions. Yeah. But, the, but I think it, you know, it goes back to this thing of the conflation of the, of the hard building, the architecture. And really, you know, is this is this a sufficiently funded? Has right. has the I mean, government provided the amount of funding? Can I have one little quick thing, which oh, is one. when speaking to the architect, one of the architects from the firm that actually did get selected, and this gets to the social relations issues, I think, is one of the problems is the permeability of sound in a, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a multifamily building, and a lot of people don't get that. That that is sort of that's in an in-between place between the private and the public. That's allowing people to have privacy and, you know, whatever. But some people just don't get that it's nice not to have it. Well, it's nice not to have to hear everybody when they, every, every toilet that gets flushed. Some reactions to, I'm not sure there's a specific anyway, question there, but some thoughts? Reactions? Well, I, I think the, 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 the huge issue, I think, for me that you're bringing up is the degree to which whatever one calls the community or the public, and then you seek to communicate, but then the different scales of how that occurs. But I also, you know, in a broad swath over the last 30 years, it's kind of the 30 years I was speaking of for say, but we clearly have, as a society, developed and sought all sorts of new me means by which the nuances of difference between humans shows. And we're completely flawed still, of course, but we, we increasingly try to find that. Um, I think the a big issue with architecture, I, the, the, the point I made at the MoMA show that a lot of people picked up on was the amount of research and development funds that goes into a Honda Civic or an Apple iPhone that precedes its introduction to the public is billions of dollars. And that the way we build housing is is really doesn't. And housing gets built by a couple people with a pickup truck or maybe a company with many pickup trucks. But, but we, we don't put that. And I think one kind of detrimental side to seeking so much community action, which we have done and we need to do, has been that we often it often derails the idea of, of that housing, like other commodities, could be much more distant. Your car tire lasts 80,000 miles if it's a Michelin tire, it, as opposed to 30. And that didn't happen through public action other than pressure for safety. So I just think community is incredibly important, but it's also, at times, Dismantled the ability to do things that might be better, uh, but believe me, I agree. With what, I understand why you're saying it. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that the, you put your finger on something so interesting. It's um, the, and actually, Sanford said this a, a few minutes ago. Something about the how does a community form and what does it mean? I mean, uh, Sean Donovan, you know, at HUD, his recommendation to the foreclosed. Uh, at the foreclosed conference was, you know, to ask the community more questions and so forth. Um, but he didn't really take on, in my opinion, the um, the problem of being a community of uh, people living in the same place, which is not exactly it's a it's a natural community of some kind, but of course it's a community of different different people and so if you gather around as a community around your housing status in a sense or even your income status or exactly. whatever I think it's a very specific sort of formation and that it would really be interesting to see what its effectiveness is what its base of effectiveness is under those conditions obviously there are probably different answers to that question um, I've been living near the Atlantic Yards development in New York City, and you know the community has been very active in trying to get you know trees planted and all the rest of it. But uh, it, uh, I think the one the one thing I would say is that there seems to be some well understood ratio of what gets given to the community and what doesn't. And you, and and I think there was the community wanted the liquor the bars to close at uh, ten. PM and the Ratner wanted them to close at 2 p.m. 
And so the end was 1 a.m., 1 a.m., I mean 2, 2 a.m., the, the result was 1 a.m., and so it's kind of a 3 to, two, three to <laughs> 1 or so <laughs> <laughs> chance of getting there or something. That, and it seemed to express itself in all sorts of different ways all the time. And I can only sit, I, 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 on the one hand, we're familiar with that lament, but on the other hand, I think the actual formation of the community is quite uh, specifically organized around this kind of base of housing, which is not necessarily an intellectual base or a you know, base of shared, you know, you share the immediate environment, and yet the immediate environment is only a very small part of your life, in a sense. So. Okay, so we'll, we'll take one more question because I know the hour is getting late. For two, up two. Uh, we'll take two. Sure, go ahead, and we'll, we'll stay, they'll stay a little bit after we're done. Yeah? Um, I've been a developer of affordable housing. We call it affordable housing, not low-income housing um, now. Um, and we really don't use public housing for a little bit over 25 years. And I've worked with some great architects, Rob Quigley, who actually taught here a number of years ago, up in San Diego. And um, one of the problems that I see is how do we get your profession, the architecture profession, more involved in the industry? Um, I don't see the AIA sponsoring a lot of seminars on how to become more involved in affordable housing. Um, I don't think we get some of the great architects of our time involved in it, uh, now on the community level, and I have to live in Cape Cod now. Um, and it's very hard to get some of the great talent that there is out there involved in this process. So what can be done to get more of that great talent involved in solving some of these problems? Right, I think it, it, it's a follow question, but it's still something to do. It. So, so one of the things about the tax rate really we didn't show is that there are developers that are doing some very interesting things. They're very, uh, very well accepted by the community, but go well beyond what we would normally have gotten in these different programs. It isn't formulaic. So it's a good question. I mean, what's, what's your thought on that? It's happening in Southern California. It is. It's starting to happen. But how, how did that come to pass? Basically, architects are reaching out to developers. Developers are reaching out to architects. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of the Howling. Yeah. But what's happened is that the you know, the wealthy communities like the Santa Monica, West Hollywood, the Beverly Hills that are, you know, they're like everyone else. They, they don't want affordable housing because of the stigma or the so to speak stigma that comes with it, you know. And I've been on these meetings where, you know, someone says those people will have kids and you know, their kids are gonna ride bikes on the sidewalk. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the, the, there are some pretty smart de uh, developers of affordable housing, mostly nonprofits that are architect-led. That the executive directors are architects, and they've reached out and they've seen design as the way to get their projects through the red tape. And this and is exactly what you know. The, 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 where the tax credit has this appeal is it's, it's, it's a much more mar market responsive because it wasn't. Uh, you know, we talked about what we didn't talk about the public housing that much was how the siting decisions were made and predictably led to where they were located. Low income housing tax credits are located in a very wide range of communities, and as I said, the community uh, pushes back. And if you have an architect that can go in and say. You know, we can create something that looks great and wonderful, but isn't necessarily a, a sort of stale, uh, off-the-shelf kind of model, then you have scope so ratchet. And I'm interested in the same question you are. Why doesn't this happen more when it can? The TCAC doesn't promote innovation, though. That's sorely missing, but it's historically coming from the private side. You know, people like Eichler, and you even look at Florida training homes. I'm not, I'm not sure if you research some of that, but the 50s, Beautiful yeah, so sums of elements, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's a there's a project in <laughs> Winter Haven, Florida, done by Crane Homes and Architect named Gene Lee did in 1952. That was like a three block development, and over time, people added on these little. There's, there's a direct answer to that question, though. When when we were doing the work in Houston, the one the first thing we did was I went out to a developer. Uh, in the outskirts of Houston, we built 368 houses here and then complex new offices. And that would have like that low income housing, affordable housing is becoming quasi private housing. They built $16 million worth of housing for a $4,500 architecture fee. It's 
we're going to owe two eight percent at twelve dollars a house. <laughs> when I moved to New York, I tried to find out what HPD spent on housing. I think it was one hundred twenty five dollars per year a housing unit, and seventy five to design it. Now that's a terrible generalization, but I think one reason nobody's involved was, and I hate to say it's the money because I really don't think it's the money per se, but the machine of housing and even affordable housing. The story I hear about from most people who develop it these days is it might cost $375 a square foot to build it rather than $275 because there's seven funding streams each with different parameters and the soft costs go through the roof and then the dwelling sells back down to something below market even though it costs more than market to produce it. But that's the whole point. It speaks, I mean, it speaks to how this does create a, a space for potential great design and, you know, it and, and we, we all want to see it. So you, you pose the right, it's not a rhetorical question, but it'll have to remain that way for now. But it is really what we want to get at. Why don't you get it? And I think you know, part of what Catherine kind of says is that this property is in a field of forces. And while some developers may take one view in this, this program may create that space and scope, for a lot, it's just more friction in trying to get it done. And they, they want to turn the capital quick, and they think they've got a model. They're used to working with the state agency in a particular way. But if the community, the community could be the thing that, you know, and is the thing, I think, in many cases, that's pushing this, or architectural-led uh, firms, which you hear more and more about, you know, architects becoming, you know, developers and creating their own firms. But we have a question in the back, so I want to make sure I get to. Oh, I just, I had a quick recommendation too. You can you can look at organizations like the Taproot Foundation. I find that sometimes nonprofits are kind of a way to go to fill in the gap of projects. Uh, so it's kind of like Doctors Without Borders. Uh, they'll provide design professionals for you for DM for projects. It's called Taproot. The Taproot project. Taproot, Taproot. Taproot Foundation. Yeah, I, I personally I work for uh, Heat at Cambridge, which is a nonprofit that weatherizes low income housing, and we. We mostly work on uh, churches, uh, shelters, uh, projects that wouldn't necessarily get any kind of state funding. So it was kind of this small loophole that we really wanted to fill. So, so we do have a question back there. Right, the conversation can continue, but I'll call it formally uh, the session over. Uh, my name is Jason Lee. I work for a Dutch uh, architecture Sorry, I'm say, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we in uh, social and affordable housing in Europe. And uh, I'm sure you guys are probably aware that uh, in the Netherlands, the history of urbanism for the last hundred years has been driven by social and affordable housing. And the sort of two things that, that are kind of fundamental to our work are always about the, the curation of public, communal, and private space, and then also the, uh, the tenant mix. And I'm wondering if in the American Tidbits of history. The, 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 the American Public Housing you know, launched formally in 37. It was funded in 34 through the Wagner Stagel Act. And it was Stagel, who was the uh, congressman from Alabama, I believe. He was also half of the Glass Stagel Act. You know, depression era regulatory housing. One separates investment banking from commercial banking, the other takes public housing. Glass Stagel came undone in 98 when Citibank merged with Travelers. And Bill Clinton had to sign the law in Cambridge, I assume, looking over his shoulder. But the, but the reason I bring all that up is that when, when public housing was first formed, banks and every other private development really attacked it as socialist government intervention and unfair competition. So I think that question of legislating mixtures of demographics and households, it's, it's almost impossible within a market that basically declares any intervention to be unjust. And you do get, I, I think the issue now that's so bizarre, and the reason I entered into it, is the Quality Housing and Work Responsibility Act, which made it legal to quote unquote, and this is legal language, deconcentrate poverty. To me, that was a topological spatial climatic closures. That wasn't, and, but at that point, you, you could almost feel people at HUD grasping for what you're describing, but not being able to attach it to real people. And, uh, but grasping at a new spatialization. And that to me is when I thought, you know, I'm going to get involved with this. That's interesting. Uh, that's a spatial project that, but uh, in terms of community, uh, Sanford Twitter will tell you afterwards maybe a story about lions and hyenas 
And well, how, how a weaker entity can, can take advantage of a more powerful entity. And I think one thing about community and this kind of the community fighting with the raptor development is, you know, Dana Cup has a beautiful article on community property, the historian of UCLA, arguing that American constituencies still value land, property, in a kind of homesteading sensibility, mm -hmm. where one is one is not challenged on having domain over property if they are perceived to have done enough work to acquire it. Yeah. And that in the in the United States at this, this period of time, data is saying that this is over the contest contestation of the use air base and Playa Vista. Is that in Playa Vista? Like, that huge swaths of the American population do not look at the way land is being used as being worthy. The people who are controlling the deployment of land are not worthy of the land. And that the ethos that tells them this is an old homesteading land that you should physically it. I bring all that up because I think all of this is in its infancy. It's, I think we're completely yeah. starting over. I think we have to stop. No, 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 just so to call attention to you and from Sanford, then I'm going um, to okay. uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, the other thing that's happening is, I mean, just uh, along with those old sort of old-fashioned relationships to property, that there is also this now this uh, threat of detachability of physicality from credit. That's what's happened with this recent use of eminent domain to get the mortgages in San Bernardino to separate mortgages from the house to seize the mortgage and to deal with it as a credit and you know financial. Uh, uh, instrument and and uh, and there's a lot of arguments about how that has not you, physicality and credit are always linked. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, not yeah. property. Yeah. Eminent uh, over. It. So it's a use of yeah. An eminent domain is always been, so that's a, a, a jurisdictional issue, but it's a very interesting treatment of how we're actually separating these things, and so we can. That's why also why we kind of tended toward. Terrible construction, you know, and terrible. The, the cheaper the construction, in certain sense, the uh, the lighter its force in a way, or the lighter its durability, uh, the lightness of its durability in relationship to the sort of uh, uh, mortgage system, which is quite uh, substantial and heavy and long-standing. And then you have sort of a, a entropic process happening to the physical property itself, where it's falling apart far before the mortgage runs out. So there's all sorts of, you know, disconnects. The unbearable lightness of durability. The unbearable lightness of durability. Uh, <laughs> I'll just try to throw a couple of things in here. About and it always seemed to me, in my passive knowledge of all of this, uh, and, and working in architecture schools, is that the source of public housing or housing, it, you know, it, had, it was, in, was in, you know, in Britain. And most of the intellectuals who came over to the United States who brought housing to the curriculum uh, in, in architecture schools were, in fact, British. It had a status there that it simply, um, well, it lost very quickly after the fall of the great modernist public housing uh, movements. Um, it, but it does strike me, nonetheless, that that was an Anglo-Saxon country. And one of the things that strikes me, uh, having lived in Europe uh, quite a bit, is that the situation with housing is very different here than it is there. Now, the reasons would be illuminating uh, once they were brought to light. They simply have not yet been. But one of the important things is to realize the different relationship that exists between social life and markets, whereas the common consensus here in the United States especially, but in fact also in England, which is perhaps a paradox, is that um, the markets should determine the organization uh, of social life, rather than the social exigencies actually determining the markets. That's to say, to make the market serve uh, society rather than the other way around. Now, Michael Bell is the guy who got me interested in housing in the first place, because he kept talking about Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods is a landmark sort of moment which transformed the landscape in the which now, um, but it does strike me, and this is the last thing I want to say, and when he just brought up, um, um, what's his name? looking over Bill Clinton's shoulder, uh, Newt Gingrich. Uh, in the work I used to do, yes, the, I, it, it, you know, the, his presence and the presence of the contract with America, the, the, social po the articulation of the social policy under which we would spend billions on prisons 
as part of our social policy, uh, and that we would house people for $45,000 a year, the rate of 2 million going on to 3 million in this country, was a clear decision with ramifications that spread throughout the organization and the, the ways in which Americans decided to rationalize their, their social life in their cities. And these are very, it's a very complicated thing. So to figure out why these are specific problems to the, United, the American context um, is something we really need to think about. Too much land. Well, race, race, yeah. race has a lot to do. Yeah, race has a lot to do. Um, so with and that, people in Please, uh, please yeah, join yeah, me. Uh, please join me in thanking what I think was an incredibly <laughs> interesting.